this is Houseways Mains. It is September 15th and Tuesday, and we are um, meeting on H954, which is the miscellaneous tax bill. Uh, we've been over uh, the bill in various forms many times. Um, and uh, in the last week or so, we've um, tentatively agreed to add some substantive changes to it. Um, Abby is here this morning to walk us through those. My uh, hope is that this morning we will vote on our proposed amendments and they're gonna be, because we have possession of the bill, these are gonna be um, uh, concurring with an amendment. So that's, that's the format. Um, if we're successful in doing that, they'll go on notice. I don't know if they go on notice today or tomorrow, but they'll, I believe the plan is to have them up for action on Thursday and Friday, but we're gonna be as flexible as we can be because that's, uh, that's the world we're in. Um, I, before we start, does anyone on the committee have any announcements or anything they wanna uh, say or ask about? Other than good morning. Good. Um, so Abby, why don't you get us started? Um, and Robin, uh, you guide this as much as you'd like. So um, uh, in terms of making sure that the information gets out there. Okay. Great. Good morning. Um, Sorsha, oh, there she goes. Thank you, Sorsha. Why don't we start with the actual language, if that's okay? I think that would be the most useful. Um, I do. There is a side by side that's available on the web page, um, but I think that this is actually the quickest um, way to run through the changes. So, this new draft 1.4, dated 9 11 2020, makes a few instances of amendment. Um, most of these, I believe almost all of these at this point, the committee has seen. Um, last week, we went over this first instance. If you could scroll down, Sorsha, thank you. This is moving the billing and collection of the property tax to the state. It is a change from what was passed in the House um, rather than requiring the Department of Taxes to submit an implementation plan. Instead, this is a study, um, a report studying potential approaches to transitioning the responsibility rather than saying, how is this going to happen? Um, tell us step by step. So it's um, also been pushed back to March 15th of 2021. Um, in the sex, second instance of amendment, um, this was seen um, last week. This reinserts the language that was passed by the House for the use tax safe harbor reporting. So this is identical language to what was um, voted out of the House before the bill went to the Senate. The Senate did remove this and put in a um, reporting requirement instead. So that's been removed and the House language has been reinserted. Um, you can scroll down, unless there are any questions. I don't see any. Great. The third instance of amendment is actually the, the meat of this um, of this concurrence with propose, proposals of amendment. Um, it, re, it removes um, a section that was added by the Senate um, to create a sales tax exemption for paper bags. That was um, removed. That is removed in this language because it was already passed in a bill back in June, um, and this now inserts what. Colloquially, it is referred to as cloud tax. So it's imposing sales and use tax on vendor hosted pre-written computer software. So software as a service. Um, it removes the existing session law exemption for um, pre-written pre computer software access remotely. It adds in a new definition, um, vendor hosted pre-written computer software, which is based on a Rhode Island definition because that's a streamlined um, agreement state that already imposes tax on these um, services. So it's, it's, would be a, it's something that uh, vendors are already used to collecting if they're selling in Rhode Island. Um, so George has, will, I'm sorry, George has a question. George? Yeah, I'm sorry. My question was way back on the very first point that you made. Um, and that was pushing the report on the state collecting property taxes. Why are we pushing it back to March 15th? of 2021. So that why, not, why not getting it in January so we would have time to act on it? Mm -hmm. <coughs> oh, pardon me. Um, uh, 
If I may, may I um, yeah. refer to Representative Shai? Um, that was our discussion that she had indicated um, March 15th would be um, enough time to give the department time to write the report. Um, and, and then that might, that is right around crossover. So I, it may not be actionable at that time, but it would still yeah, exactly. be the next question. Uh, Robin? I'm not sure I have a whole lot more to add. You know, we had originally uh, passed this back on May 22nd and the, uh, the Senate took it out entirely and just wanted, um, sorry, I'm confusing. I, I, I've been thinking about the cloud, not about this one. So I've got to go back. Um, they didn't want, they didn't want anything. And so this was kind of a way of softening our position and moving a little bit closer to the Senate. Um, without. I understand making it a report rather than uh, making it a study rather than um, an implementation plan. I just sort of feel like it would be nice to have it get the information back at a point that we could actually do something with it in 2021. Right. So we'll delay it for a year, but we're probably part of the biennium. Um, you know, if we had passed it in May or June, you know, that's different than passing it at the end of September. So I think we were trying to give them a little bit more time to get themselves organized. So what about February 1st? Does that, that, does that help? I think so. Yeah. I think that would give us time before crossover to, to do something with it. I don't know, Robert, if you think that's adequate time for them or not, but. I, I think it's a show of understanding. <laughs> That would be fine. I would be fine with that. I, I would just say by March, they are so deep into stuff that they aren't going to be working on this report come March, you know, as we That's approach true. March. Right. Yeah. My, my guess is they will have it written. Um, uh, if, if we ask them to write it, it'll get written before January, um, just because of, and certainly before February 1st, right? Um, because of tax kinds of issues. So anyway, um, is February 1st agreeable with people? Yeah. Yep. Okay. okay, great. All right. Uh, Robin, your hand is still up. Are you uh, uh, I had a question yes. on something? Yeah. Yes, I did. Where did I have my question? Oh, I know what it was. Um, Abby, on the pre-written software and using the Rhode Island definition, which I think is great and it ensures that we're not an outlier, are, is Rhode Island the only one near us that is using this definition? Or is Rhode Island sort of one among many? Do we have a sense of that? Um, yes, let me pull up my research. Sorry, I don't know off the top of my head. I, I did um, back in January when Graham and I were we're presenting on this. We did look at all of the other states. So I'm just looking quickly over my list. I had focused primarily on full streamlined states. Right. Um, in terms of what's close by, not seeing other, sorry, I'm just looking for other uh, New England states. Ohio is another streamlined state and they do tax this, but I'm not sure about their definition. I'd have to go back and check. Um, Wash, I, I believe Washington State it also had a very similar definition, and they are also a streamlined state. Um, but in terms of New, uh, New England states, it looks like most of them are um, actually exempting this currently. Okay. And is New York State, is that the same with New York State also? Sorry, I'm just looking through. Oh no, New York is um, New York is not a streamlined state. It's not a they full are definitely state. Definitely not streamlined, right? Yeah, but yeah. they tax. but they do tax it. Okay, that's correct. All right, I just want to get a general sense. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, um, yeah. I'll keep moving through. Um, so in section. So the third instance of amendment inserts um, four new sections. So there's the definition section. There are two sections imposing sales tax and then use tax on pre-written computer software. So scroll down. Thank you, Sorsha. And then section 10D repeals the um, existing session law. 
which was exempting pre-written software that's accessed remotely. So those are the four sections that um, would tax pre-written computer software. The next instance of amendment is more of a cleanup for what passed out of the Senate and is no longer relevant because of timing issues. So that's deleting um, the official state revenue estimate that was due in um, August that the deadline is passed. Um, and it's also deleting a technical fix that will need to be dealt with um, next session, but it doesn't need to be dealt with here. It, the way the language was drafted, it, it doesn't do anything the way the Senate passed it at this point, just because of the timing. Um, in the fifth instance of amendment, this changes all of, or sorry, this removes the existing effective date and adds in the tax increment financing district sections that you saw with Becky Wasserman. So this is the language that you've already seen. It adds in section 29 and section 30, and it changes the, it extends the, um, the dates for incurring debt. And there's this section, second section that deals with the Burlington Waterfront TIF, same thing. That it is now dealt with in section 29 for the extension of the date, and it strikes existing statute relating to an extension. So it's more clean up in the second section. And this final section 31 is a new section, but it's um, still the effective date. So it's just lining them up with how the bill is now drafted. It puts um, back in the use tax safe harbor um, effective date. It, is still retroactive to January 1st of this year. It adds in the uh, pre-written computer software effective date, which would take place January 1st. So the first revenue would be received um, from those transactions on, I believe it's February 25th. So it's always a month later. And then it keeps the other effective dates that were in the, the bill um, as past the Senate. And I can walk through though. There's the universal service charge, the annual link up and um, some retroactive uh, refunds for amending the statute of limitations for personal income tax. Okay. So that's um, the end of the, of the amendments that have been discussed in committee. Uh, again, this is drafted now as a committee bill because the bill was committed to ways and means. As a committee amendment. So it's, um, uh, and I don't know how I happened to find it, but I found my folder with all the uh, all the other <laughs> sections in the bill. Um, just to remind people that what we passed all these many of them very technical uh, sections um, way back, and the Senate most of them. So this bill, um, once we concur with amendments, has all those sections in it. Um, we're not going to go over them again unless somebody on the committee wants. Uh, Abby to do that. And, and if you do, we'll make time to do it. Um, but I just want to remind everybody that I don't remember how many sections this bill has in all, 30, 30 substantive sections. Um, so there's lots of other pieces in it. I just, I just, I, I tend to forget. So I just want people to remember that. Uh, Robin and then Pat. Um, thank you. Um... Oh, so VSAC is not in here as an instance of amendment because we are keeping the language that the, the Senate, Senate did, but it's a change from a, the House perspective from what we had in there. Exactly. So we're agreeing with their amendments and doing further amendments. Right. So I should probably be mentioning that particular Senate amendment or not? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The House has never voted on it. Right. Yeah. Yep. Right. Were there any other big ones from the Senate that I need to be sure? Probably, probably, probably. Uh, but let, let me get to Pat's question first and then, um, yeah, Pat. So thank you. Um, I got called away for a second, so I think I might have missed it. But in, in regards to the cloud tax, yep. just a refresher, refresh my memory. Did we pass that out of our committee without that, correct? We were going to, at that, on March 13th, which was when we left the building, um, we were going to put it in a property tax um, rate setting bill. So we had we had sort of tentatively agreed on it, um, but we weren't going to put it in the miscellaneous tax bill. As it turned out, during the uh, June session, you know, when we are pandemic yep. one, um, we passed a property tax bill and we um, were focused entirely on making sure that those rates were set and didn't want to uh, add anything um, to it that might create
create issues. And so we didn't put the cloud in at that point. There was some discussion in committee about putting it in, um, but we decided Recall. not to. Yeah. So we didn't actually vote it out in either bill um, until now, if we do it now. Okay. But we were, right. we were ready to do it. Um, so it, it did get, we did have quite a lot of testimony on it. Um, yeah, sorry, we call. Yeah. So I, we, I just, just, just so you know, I mean, I was opposed to that then and I did support this bill and I don't think I can with that in there. Um, okay. yeah. Only because I've, well, I disagree with it for one thing, and, and I have some folks out here who are really opposed mm -hmm. to it. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, and, um, you know, we, we're going to do, as we do, two votes. Um, we're going to yeah. vote on the package of amendments, and then we're going to vote on the bill as amended, um, which will have, um, among other things, the VSAC language in it and the TIF language in it. So um, just for whatever, for whatever that means. Um, okay. Uh, so Robin, you asked about other issues. Uh, um, we can, I can ask Abby to go through those if the committee would like to listen to it. Um, that's really a question for everybody on the committee. It, to some extent, you need, you need it for preparing for the caucus and for the floor, but I want to be sure that the committee um, um, would like to all hear all that. Um, okay. I don't know if there's a lot or... I, just the, the um, big things they they took the the state administration implementation plan out they took the use tax table out they added the vsec language in those are the three that i'm most right. aware of and, but, and we've um, amended though some of their amendments for the proposal yeah. so i'm but unless there are others ones abby, that we already know about then then ones that we haven't talked about abby were there are others that i haven't mentioned that tampon tax tampon okay. tax that did not make its way into this bill, no. Um, the others are smaller changes like the sales and use tax exemption. There was there were some changes added in for judiciary fees, but again, they're very small impacts. Um, those were the biggest changes that were added in. There is the change to the removing the interest rate for um, personal income tax, so removes, or for, for underpayment of taxes, they removed the um, higher interest rate for underpayment compared to um, when the state is owing interest. So that's that's another change. Um, if if you want me to run through all of the changes, I can go through the section by section. It's probably the easiest way to see it. Or side by side, I'm sorry. Yeah, is that something the committee would like to run through? I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it. I just want to be sure people want to hear it. Can't tell. And if not, I can chat with Abby later. So it's up to everybody else. Somebody on the committee would like to hear that? No, I have one head shake there. I got Scott <laughs> saying no. <laughs> um, well, it's posted. Is that right? The section by section. How many sections are in it? The side there are 31 with the new. Um, uh, affected dates because of the addition of the TIF language. Okay. Well, if somebody would like Abby to do it, then uh, please speak up. And otherwise, uh, we won't. Um, we also need to do the fiscal note. So I, I want to give a chance for that. Any other questions for Abby? Graham, I know you're here. See you. I'm here. Um, so I've, I've sent a, a, a fiscal note to Sorsha um, on this proposal of amendment. Um, sorry for the record, I'm Graham Campbell. I work at the Joint Fiscal Office. <clears throat> I'm presenting a fiscal note on the House of Proposal of Amendment for H954, um, the miscellaneous tax bill. And by and large, there are two the revenue sections in this bill, um, major revenue section. The first is section eight, which is the um, the changing of the use tax safe harbor table. We estimate in fiscal 21, this will wow. uh, reduce sales tax revenues by $775,000. Um, and the majority of that revenue loss is just the change of the table itself. And then about 20, 30,000 of it is the, um, 
the provision that sort of um, excludes those with AGI under 20,000 from using the, the table. Um, the estimate this year, the es estimate is based upon data from tax year 2019, which um, based upon the information from the tax department has been a lower year for use tax collections than in the past. Um, and we expect it to be a, a, a lower year for use tax collections, even though the data is not quite complete. And this is because we think that people are more aware of the fact that um, remote sales um, are, are being charged sales tax um, because of the Wayfair decision and also because um, vendors like Amazon and uh, Walmart are collecting sales tax on their remote sales. So the more that people become aware of um, those that situation, the, the less likely we are to collect use tax. So by changing the table um, at a time when people are becoming more aware of um, the fact that they don't owe as much use tax leads to a smaller revenue loss than what would otherwise have occurred. So that's seven hundred seventy-five thousand dollars, and then the other, um, and that's the sales tax, and therefore affects the education fund. And then the second um, um, revenue piece here is the addition of the uh, repeal, the, the session law exemption for um, vendor-hosted pre-written software, um, and because of the effective date in January twenty twenty-one. Um, we estimate that it'll raise $2.7 million in 21, um, $7.6 million in 22, and then growing all the way up to nine and a half million in fiscal 24. So as I've said in this community before, this sort of highlights the, the fast growth of this, um, this type of software. Um, and that is, that is what we see in the data <laughs> every single year. Um, and so we anticipate that this, would, this is going to grow um, pretty swiftly. Um, and because this is sales tax, um, it will benefit the state's education fund. There are two other minor, minor potential fiscal um, uh, things in this bill. The first is in section six, and this is the increasing the, uh, the property tax hearing officers per diem. We project that would have minimal fiscal impact of about $30,000 or less. And that's a, a general fund expense. And then finally, I I put a note here on section 29, which is the TIF language. Um, we don't expect immediate fiscal impact on the education fund from this, um, but as was discussed in committee to the extent that um, the delay in um, debt incurring um, leads to a delay in the projects, um, it could lead for a, a municipality to have less time to collect tax increment on any projects that are, that are built. And so to the extent that that you know, puts pressure on a municipality, it is possible that down the road, um, um, a delay in, in debt and a delay in projects might have a fiscal impact, but in the immediate term, um, no impact to the education fund of this provision. So with that, I, I can take any questions, although this committee's chewed on a lot of the, these proposals. Um, Uh, let me see if there's any questions. Um, give people a minute here. Joey. Um, I, I was just wondering, Sam, was Sam mentioned that he was going to have an amendment on VSAC, but we didn't do anything with that, did we? Or did he offer any amendment on that? No. Uh, um, I just sent him a text. He, he's not here because he's sick, um, but he and I had exchanged texts last night and this morning, um, and I think he had decided not to offer it. Um, BSEC had some concerns about sort of tying their hands. Um, no, I, I, no, I was very, I, I, yeah. I was hoping that it was not going to be included, so I'm, I'm pleased that he's not offering it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I just sent him a note asking him, is it okay if I say that he's not offering it? And I haven't heard back, but that's what he had told me last night was that he wasn't going to. So the language exists. Uh, I think Abby wrote it and I think it went to everybody, but um, he's, uh, he wasn't gonna put it out there. Um, you know, I, the, I think the message got through to VSAC that we would like this money used um, for uh, particularly uh, uh, 
at-risk at kids or, you know, first-time uh, college student, what, you know, whatever the various groups are, um, I think they understand that, but I think it's so tentative about whether they actually do this and what the profits are going to be that they'd like to keep some flexibility. And Tom Little's available if we wanted to hear from him, but I said I didn't think we needed to. Mm -hmm. so, but okay with everybody. Bill, can't you? Yeah, Janet, we had a note today from Tom Little. Right. That. Yeah. <clears throat> he talked about uh, reporting back to us yeah. or keeping us up to date. Yeah, which, and, you know, they come in pretty much every year for something. And so we'll have a chance to um, to ask about this. If, you know, I, I didn't prepare language on their reporting in um, partly because we can, we can ask for the report anyway. And if they don't go into this, there won't be anything to report about. So, um, but anyway, I, I, um, we could add language. It didn't seem important to me to do it. Um, I felt fine just relying on our relationship with them. Um, uh, are there any other questions uh, that are out there? Is somebody ready to make a motion on these amendments? Happy to move it if nobody else wants to. Okay. Um, is there a, so this would be the package of amendments. Um, is that right? That, that's the motion? Um, yes. And, yeah. and is there a second to that? Second. Okay. Um, so it's been moved and seconded that the um, Ways and Means Committee uh, um, amend the, our proposed amendment to the bill um, as Abby went over with us. And this is this eight page document with, uh, I don't know, looking to see how many amendments there are, a number of them. Um, Madam Chair? Yes. May I just inquire whether the committee wanted to change the reporting date to February 1st? Yeah. For our, All right. Okay. So, yes. so your that, amendment includes the February 1st reporting It does. Date. It is now draft 1.5 with today's date. Perfect. Okay. Um, so it's been moved and seconded that we um, approve draft 1.5 with the changed effective date. Thank you. Um, is there any discussion? Um, people a minute here, George. Um, I will just say that I, I had understood that the Senate proposal amendment included the tampon tax. And I have to say that I'm rather disappointed that it is not in here. Um, I'm, you know, having a little trouble with the, the whole thing with it not being in there. No, it, it didn't get in the Senate version. I think I had a little bit of discussion in the Senate, but it's not in there. Um, Bill. And I'm going to be voting no on the package because of the cloud. Okay. Um, any other comments that people want to make? Okay, Robin. Um, you... I'll call the roll and remind people we'll have two votes. We'll have a vote on the package of amendments, then we'll have a vote on the bill because we have position on the bill. The bill. You know and that this is on the amendments. Right. Okay. So oh. I will start. Uh, Representative Anthony. Yes. Representative Beck. Yes. Representative Brennan. No. Representative Donovan? Yes. Representative Kornheiser? Yes. Representative Masland? Yes. Representative Shy is yes. Representative Till? Yes. Representative Young is absent. Representative Canfield? No. Representative Ansel? Yes. Okay, so that looks like 821. Okay, and now I need a motion on the bill. Moved. Okay. Moved by Jim Maslin, seconded. <coughs> Second. Leader. Uh, discussion? Okay. All right, 
are just writing down. Sorsha will be happy. Okay, so we're voting the bill out. Representative Anthony. Yes. Representative Beck. I had S3. Yes. Representative Brennan. No. Representative Donovan. Yes. Representative Kornheiser. Yes. Representative Maslin. Yes. Representative Shy is yes. Representative Till. Yes. Representative Young is absent. Representative Canfield. Yes. And Representative Ansel. Yes. So that looks like 911. Right. Yep. Okay. Um, and Robin, I'm asking you to report it. Um, thank you, everybody. And um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we have a few amendments from the floor. Um, this is a miscellaneous tax bill. So uh, I don't think our work is done, but that's okay. Be interesting. Um, so um, I'm trying to remember who, Abby, is it you who has the language on the um, education finance? Yes. I do. Okay. Okay. And I have so, enough. If you want to refresh your screen, you'll be able to see the document on the committee page. Excellent. Okay. Sersha, would you mind pulling that up or do you want me to share my screen? Great. Thank you. Okay, so Madam Chair, would you like me to summarize the language? Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Okay, the way it's currently drafted, it doesn't have any lead in language. I can draft it as a committee proposal, a committee bill. Um, this deals with the fiscal year 22 property tax um, rate letter that the commissioner of taxes issues on every December 1st. Um, and it addresses any projected education fund deficit for the current fiscal year 21. Um, this language was seen, not this first subsection, but part of this language was seen in your joint meeting with um, House Education last week. Right. So what's been added here is the first subsection A that has um, the findings and the purpose to give it more context. Um, the first sentence explains that there is this December 1st letter under Vermont statute that requires the commissioner to calculate and recommend property tax rates for the upcoming fiscal year. And within the calculation for making that recommend recommendation, the commissioner um, has to take into account any projected uh, current year deficit, as well as the requirement under statute to keep the stabilization reserve at 5%. Um, the Act 122 that the General Assembly passed back in June um, ex expressed a somewhat contrary intent, which was to address any projected ed fund deficit by using federal funds and this list of um, actions to um, reduce the burden that's placed on schools, school districts to, um, uh, to impact the uh, tax rates through their budgeting process. So this makes it very clear what the intention um, of Act 122 and this new language is. It's really to um, notwithstand current statute where the commissioner is recommending rates that would otherwise um, use the stabilization reserve and have to address the deficit through tax rates. So that's the first subsection A. Um, so if you scroll down and switch a little bit further, the second page sets out subsection B, which was seen last week. And it um, requires the commissioner of taxes in making the recommendations for the December 1st letter for fiscal year 22 um, to disregard a projected deficit for fiscal year 21 and to assume that the stabilization reserve is maintained at its rate um, that is currently the current rate um, or amount at or before admitting or issuing the December 1st letter. So it's two notwithstandings of current law and how the commissioner is um, issuing tax rates for the upcoming year. I can take questions. I hope that wasn't too confusing. Well, I, I will admit that I don't understand that language. So 
I'm hoping that somebody uh, who's reporting this does. I couldn't possibly explain that. The, the part I don't understand is the language about the um, about um, maintaining the stabilization reserve. But as long as other people understand it, Scott, you understand it, George, you understand it. No, well, I'm trying to take a close look at it right now, and I can't seem to okay. find it anywhere in any of the documents. Um, Mark, do you want to explain it to us again, or Abby? Uh, I, yeah, I, mean, I, we I would like to jump it. in because I, I think there's a little bit of an inconsistency here, and I want to make sure the committee's intent is being reflected in the language. Yeah, so, well, maybe that's why I don't understand it. <laughs> okay, so um, in Act 122, you list several ways of addressing any projected deficit in the education right. fund. Yeah. And in that language, number the number three option in there is to draw down the stabilization reserve. Right. And I'm not sure you want to do that because the deficit that we're carrying um, on the education fund outlook right now is $66.4 million, but that includes a full stabilization reserve. Okay. So if the, if the stabilization reserve were drawn down, then the deficit in the education fund is only $28 million. So, so this line, what I'm concerned about is the administration could say, okay, we're not going to include that $28 million deficit in the FY22 property tax rates, but you would then be going into FY22 with an empty stabilization reserve, which would then require them to rate, that, yeah. would, that would then require them to bring that up by $38 million on the property tax. So I'm, I'm thinking you're trying to prohibit both, both things. You want a full stabilization reserve and you don't want that to be filled with property tax money and you, want to, and you don't want the deficit to be addressed with property tax money. So um, I'm not sure drafting wise how to address that. I think that the language works, but there is that inconsistency between 122 and what you're proposing here. And it may work, but it, you know, if we're having trouble understanding it here um, a month from now, two months from now, who knows what people are gonna yeah. say it means. Um, um, can I can I show you just can I show you on the balance sheet because I think it'll make it clear to people if we can yeah. just look at the bottom line of the balance sheet. Sorsha, do you have it available? Because I, I have it on my screen. I could pop up if you don't. I I just made you a co-host. I don't have the balance sheet. Scott, do you want to jump in or do you want to wait for him to explain that? Well, I just I I just make a. I mean, I need to read the rest of it a little more closely. I think, but I'm just wondering: is there is everything after line nine just confusing the whole subject? If we just had the first nine lines in there, doesn't that do the trick? Um, well, yeah. Nine lines. No. I mean, you have to, the commissioner shall what? So well, I'm just looking at this. I, I'm looking at I'm looking at um, this draft 1.4. What page are you on? Uh, page one. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm on page two. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on page one, and I'm reading through line nine where it ends. You know, 16 BSA 4026 at five percent. Oh. Yeah. Do we need Do we need anything after that? Yeah. Well, the, the, so that was partly my suggestion to put in the reference to Act 122. Um, I'm not wed to it, but I I was wanting to. Um, I guess what I guess what I was thinking is that we passed a law Act 122, which laid out those seven yeah. strategies, and that what the way I was thinking about it is that the changes that we're trying to make in the December 1st letter are in some ways try, trying to incorporate the thinking in 122 um, so that we don't, you know, we don't end up in a situation where we pass a law at 122 and then we leave in effect a statute that sort of seems to uh, counter it or disregard it. So um, maybe you're I mean, right. I may have complicated it by adding I, that I, in. Yeah, I, I guess all you always thought of it is that, you know, we have this we have this statutory language that drives the December one tax letter. And we we hold we hold the administration to that with this clarification that they have to do it at five percent. And then all of those other, you know, things that included the reserve fund and all those other mechanisms, that's that's for the legislature after after the tax letter comes out. 
However, we want to, you know, we don't, we don't want to let the administration use those seven me mechanisms to monkey around the, with the tax letter. The tax letter comes out, it is what it is. And then we have those seven uh, mechanisms at our disposal, working with the treasurer, maybe others to deal with the, you know, the aftermath of the December one tax letter. I think that's kind of how I thought. Right. The hope here was to not create a panic with the December 1st letter was to sort of get ahead of that. Um, but maybe, maybe we're making things yeah. worse. Uh, George and then Robin. Yeah, Scott, you're not talking about stopping after line nine of page one. Yes, he is. Well, well, that just tells, I mean, that says he needs to include to cover in his letter. He needs to include the um, the deficit enough to cover the deficit. That's exactly the opposite of what we want. Well, uh, it must calculate tax rates in an amount sufficient to cover any projected fiscal year 2021 deficit. That's exactly what we're trying to avoid in the first well, nine months. But, but if okay, I I, I I see your point there, George. But um, you know, if if we, I mean, we're giving the it's going to be up to the tax commissioner to decide how to deal with that deficit. And that's what we're trying to avoid. Right. Well, this says, if you do took just the first nine lines, it says he needs to include the, the, um, to calculate the tax rates at an amount sufficient to cover the projected deficit from 2021. He, I mean, nine, nine, out of the first nine, lines tell him to do exactly what we don't want. That's just your, I, 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 can I oh, jump in yeah, here? I see. I, I missed that number. Yeah, I, I see your point. That, that, that section actually restates current law. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. And the current law is the problem, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Robin, you've been trying to get in. <laughs> okay, that was, that was the part that I was going to say is that if that's all we're going to do, we don't need this bill uh, because it's already current law. So um, that was my comment. Thanks. Um, so we're, we're back to this conundrum where we're um, saying sort of inconsistent things and my concern, I don't mind that so much, but I, I mind the fact that we're saying them in ways that nobody will understand. Um, right. So, so again, be I, inconsistent, be clear. <laughs> I, 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 th I think that the language is, as it's drafted works, but maybe we could clean it up and make it a little bit easier to explain. I mean, I, 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 but it's, it's a problem I don't know how to get around because there's in, the interaction between the stabilization reserve and the deficit. Right. And to try to nail them both down requires both of those subsections. So uh, uh, this is probably a bad idea. But um, so what we want is we want the December 1st letter to be written um, without uh, taking into account the projected deficit. And um, uh, this question without taking into account the, um, the uh, stabilization reserve. Is, is, that, is that basically what we're saying? You were, we're, I, I'm, what I'm saying is that the administration could read that language now and say that the deficit right. is actually 28 million, not $66 million. Right. And that's because they would have drawn the stabilization reserve down in 21. And that means going forward into 22, you'd have an empty stabilization reserve and a small deficit. So the portion of it that would have to be replaced in the stabilization reserve is $38 million on the property tax. So in order to avoid that, the language says that regardless of how you interpret that deficit, it's gonna be $64 million that you're not gonna raise on the property tax. Whether you call it a, a stabilization reserve or a deficit, We've got it covered so that you can't use any of that money. You can't add any of that money to the property tax bill. And I agree, it's it's confusing. I've been, <laughs> I've been angsting over it because it's um, it's 
it's um, it's awkwardly laid out in the bill, I think, in, unavoidably because of the this, this interaction between deficit and reserve stabilization reserve. I mean, at the end of the day, we want them to do a, a property tax rate letter that reflects um, uh, student count, uh, spending, uh, non-property non tax revenues, all non -property of property tax all revenues, tax. all those kinds of things. And, and we're trying to get there and it's tough. Uh, let's see, Peter, Robin, George, Scott. There you go, Peter, Robin. Um, maybe it's naive. I don't, why can't you uh, in session law, that is just for this round, say something like notwithstanding the, the VSA obligation that uh, that statute places on the secretary, uh, that it's the, uh, um, the uh, decision of the, uh, the legislative branch that a letter should reflect uh, no deficit, it should be predicated on the, the um, um, no carry in of deficit and a full, uh, a full um, uh, reserve fund and just let it go with that. Isn't that, can't you just do it directly? I think that's what this does. Okay. <laughs> but like you said, it's so complicated. I'm not sure people <laughs> will get hung up on the words. Yeah, Robin. I think I'm going in a similar kind of direction as Peter did, but just thinking about the first nine lines instead of restating um, what we do. Which nine? The first page one or page, page two? Page one, first line nines that Scott had referred to, whether we just do mm -hmm. something that said, instead of saying that, that they must calculate the tax, um, excluding, uh, you know, without consideration of the deficit and while maintaining the stabilization of reserve. I'm, I'm still, I'm not a lawyer either, but I'm just trying to get it shorter if there's some way to, to make it one or two paragraphs instead of the lengthy thing that it is, whether we could do something in that, within that top section. Yeah, I like all that first page stuff. I like, because it, okay. if you read it, you'd actually know what it meant. <laughs> <laughs> but that was because I asked to have it go in there. So um, doesn't mean it's right. George, Scott, and Jim. Yeah, I was going the same way. I mean, I I also like that first page stuff there, so people kind of understand the playing field that we're on before we make the changes. So that you know, I, I don't have any problems with that that first paragraph being there, um, but then I think you know, then we need to go on to just simply notwithstand that and saying that say that they should not consider the deficit um, when they're setting the rates, nor should they utilize money from the reserves when they calculate the rates. Um, Scott, Jim, Emily. Another yeah, so <laughs> after having a chance to read through this in detail, I mean, I would feel comfortable explaining this to somebody on the floor. I think I could boil it down into something that was understandable. Um, but as I look at, you know, the first nine lines I think are fine. And I think section B and subset section one and two are fine. It's those lines in between that I, th I think it's, it, what it is is that there's, there's something, oops, sorry. There's something here <laughs> that is my thing though. <laughs> Um, That'll teach you to argue with me. Yeah. I, think, I think what's confusing here is that in A, it starts off telling the commissioner what they must, the commissioner must do. And then it goes into this, you know, lengthy, like justification for why. And then it goes back to, you know, with some action that has to occur. And I, I think that's what kind of for a reader, a casual reader, just trying to get through this the, the first time, it kind of it kind of messes it up. Uh, Jim, Emily, and George. Um, yeah, um, generally, I think I like Peter's approach approach as modified by George. Um, we got two issues, I think. One is getting the language so that it works, and the other one is so people can understand it. And there is a benefit, I think, to having the notwithstanding language that George suggested so that it makes it clear what we intend to do. Because 
it'll be wonderful for Scott to explain it on the floor so that people in the chamber understand it. But then, you know, several weeks from now down the road, um, we want to be able to explain it in, in plain English to, to people out there. So I just that's want where to be sure that it point. works. Yeah, um, that's my worry. Yeah, Emily. Um, I, I am not concerned about the lay public reading this because I don't think they generally bother with that. Um, I am concerned about the administration um, creating intention where they want it and not where we want it. Um, and so what Mark explained, it seems to me like a little extra on that, just that very final paragraph starting on line 12 to be clear about what we mean by the stabilization reserve would make sense. But I've seen Abby try to jump in a few times and I wonder if she has any ideas. <laughs> I don't know if Abby can raise her hand. Yes, she can. <laughs> Abby. Sure. Um, I think that everyone is is making points that I was um, struggling with while trying to draft it and put it together. Um, nice. And I tried to, I think you've all uh, laid it out as you're reading through it again, just to lay out what current law says, what the commissioner has to do already, what Act 22, 122 was saying, and then what this language, that's kind of the, the first subsection when I was walking through, but parts of it could be removed. The whole first subsection is really just setting the context. Um, the second subsection on page two, subsection B does um, what is being discussed as this is what we really need to be making clear is the directive from the General Assembly. I just want to point out that what may be confusing about um, B2 on the second page is that it's whatever the stabilization reserve amount is at the time of making the December 1st letter. Um, and I can maybe rework the, yeah. the wording there um, so that it's neither the 5% nor a full drawdown. Yeah. So that's what it currently says. I just wanted to. There's no, no middle ground in it. Yeah. Um, you know, um, go back to why we're doing this in the first place. Um, um, we're, we're trying to let school boards know that we're, we don't want to see a December 1st letter that says there's going to be a 20 cent property tax increase. That, that's really what we're trying to do here. Um, and we want, we want school boards to be reassured that we're paying attention to that and it's not our, um, it, that, that it's not our intention to have a 20 cent property tax increase this year any more than we did, or for the coming fiscal year, any more than, than we did for the current fiscal year. Um, and we also want to be sure, having, having communicated that to the school boards, that we've set in place a process for this December 1st letter to reflect that intention. That that's really what we're trying to accomplish, and so I think it's I think it's important that we do something. Um, I'm content to have it written any way the committee feels um, accomplishes those goals, but I don't want to lose sight of those goals. I don't want to get so tied up in um, in the words that we lose sight of what it is we're trying to do here. Mark, you're trying to jump. Yeah, I just want to say it seems like there's two issues. One, one issue is the difficulty of explaining this on the floor, and the other issue is how would the administration interpret this language. And it seems on the second point, um, would it be possible to ask the tax department how they would read this? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna. I mean that yeah. that would that would clarify at least you'd know that your intent yeah. is, is going to be followed yeah. through. Yeah. The issue about explaining it on the floor, I don't know exactly how much how many people pay really close close attention to what's in there, but. Um, Anyways, I, so the second the second part of the problem may be dealt with just by talking to somebody over in tax. Yeah, and I, uh, right, uh, uh, that's an ex a great idea. Um, and um, uh, I don't know whether we uh, they haven't seen the language, Abby, or they've seen it only if they bothered to look. Yeah. Um, so, Sorsha, could you send it um, to Craig uh, Volio? Yes, I will. Um, so I don't know whether we'll be able to do that this morning, but the, the other thing is that it's helpful for us to all be talking about what it's, how we read it, um, because that will help whoever reports it, um, it, you know, be able to explain it and sort of anticipate what some of the issues are. Yeah. Other, uh, other suggestions or ideas, thoughts? 
Uh, Scott, do you want to see a redraft along the lines of what you were talking about? Um, I'd like to see a redraft based on the conversation between Abby and Craig, I think is okay. more important right now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, that sounds fine. Um, it wasn't my plan to vote this out today. Um, I would like, I think, to finish with it tomorrow if we can. Um, and so uh, we'll communicate with tax. Um, I also want to be sure that uh, superintendents and school boards that have they've seen it. Um, I um, want to give them a chance to testify on it um, as well. So we'll do that tomorrow. Anything else? Sounds like we have a plan. Thank you, Mark. Good idea. Um, and um, I think I'll see everybody on the floor at 10. Um, and Robin, you know, if you need assistance as you do the caucus of the whole, we'll, we'll be there or right behind you. <laughs> So I'm counting on it. Thanks. <laughs> Good. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We'll we'll see you tomorrow morning. See you in a minute. Do hold tomorrow. We will meet tomorrow because we didn't finish. We need more work on this. Okay. <laughs>